Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And this week, <laughs> I'm freaking out a little bit. The health policy nerd in me um, is totally fangirling right now because we have a guest on whose work I have followed for years. I have the utmost respect for Dr. Katherine Baker. Thank you so much for joining us. Kate. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and thank you for being a fan. You are now my favorite podcast host. <laughs> so I'm going to kick things off by introducing uh, Dr. Katherine Baker and then we're going to dive in because we have a lot to talk about. So today we're really going to focus on the U.S. healthcare system. Um, you all have had a lot to say about it, and we have an expert to help us, you know, talk through some of the issues that we're facing and maybe look ahead to what the future might hold. So, Dr. Katherine Baker is provost of the University of Chicago. She's a leading scholar in the economic analysis of healthcare policy. She's the Emmett Dedman Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, where she served as dean for five years before being appointed provost. Dr. Baker's research focuses on the effectiveness of public and private insurance, including the effect of reforms on the distribution and quality of care. Her large-scale research projects include the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which is a randomized evaluation of the effects of Medicaid coverage, something that I have read hundreds of times. Um, and her research has been published in journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, Health Affairs, JAMA, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. She serves on the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Health Advisors and the Advisory Board of the National Institute for Healthcare Management. She has served as the chair of the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission, chair of the Board of Directors of Academy Health, and commissioner on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. From 2005 to 2007, she served as a Senate-confirmed member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, where she played a leading role in the development of health policy. Dr. Baker earned her BA in economics from Yale and her PhD in economics from Harvard. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so with that, uh, Andrea, I know you wanted to jump in before we dive into yeah. things here. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Kate, hopefully, you know, we can, we can call you Kate here. Um, Please. you know, this, this topic of, you know, healthcare structure and function and health disparities is something that, you know, Jess and I talk a lot about privately, but is something that we deal with um, from, from our followers on social media and from our listeners, because it's often conflated with science and it's often conflated with medical interventions. And I think a lot of people just don't understand how they are very distinct things and and some of the disparities in health outcomes are not a function of scientific technologies, but rather how our healthcare system operates and how it's funded and so on. So I'm I'm thrilled that we're we we have one of the the biggest experts in this topic to really help people um demystify some of this confusion and misconception. Well, it's such an important topic, and I'm, I'm thrilled to dive in with you. And the more evidence we can bring to bear, the better policymaking will be on these incredibly complicated questions. All right. So with that, maybe I can provide just a very high level overview of the structure of the U.S. healthcare system, and then we're going to really uh, pick your brain, Kate. Um, all right. So the U.S. healthcare system is a complex mix of public and private payers and providers. It is the most expensive healthcare system in the world, but does it deliver the best care? And obviously, we're going to talk more about that. But I did pull um, the latest report from the Commonwealth Fund. It was their latest issue brief, and we'll link to this in the show notes. And here are some key takeaways from that report. Healthcare spending, both per person as a, and as a share of GDP, continues to be far higher in the U.S. than in other high-income countries, yet the U.S. is the only country that doesn't have universal health coverage. The U.S. has the lowest life expectancy at birth, the highest death rates for avoidable or treatable conditions, the highest maternal and infant mortality, and among the highest suicide rates. 
the U.S. has the highest rate of people with multiple chronic conditions and an obesity rate nearly twice the OECD average. Americans see physicians less often than people in most other countries and have among the lowest rate of practicing physicians and hospital beds per 1,000 population. And finally, screening rates for breast and colorectal cancer and vaccination for flu in the U.S. are among the highest. But then when we look at COVID vaccination, it trails many nations. Uh, Andrea, I think you wanted to add a little extra detail. Yeah, here. just just a little extra because I think because I think it underscores, you know, what what Jess said and, and what Kate is going to really dig into is that, um, you know, we don't have universal coverage. And if you look at our health outcomes, you'll notice that they're stratified and there's further disparities in health outcomes and life expectancy um, at extremes of the socioeconomic spectrum. Right. So we know that inequalities in life expectancy and even in health outcomes um, has actually been growing. So so even. Um, you know, decades, a few decades ago, if you looked at individuals who um, were born in 1920, there was a six year difference in life expectancy be between the, the men with the top 10% income and the men with the bottom 10% income. With women, it was um, 4.7 years difference. But as you shift that birth year to 1950, that disparity has more than doubled. So with men, now it is a 14-year age disparity in life expectancy between the wealthiest and the poorest in the U.S. And in women, um, that that's actually almost tripled, where it's grown from 4.7 years to 13 years. And on top of that, while men across the board, the life expectancy has been increasing relatively over the years. For women in the bottom 50% of income, the life expectancy has actually been declining in certain populations. And, and there's a lot of factors, um, you know, based on that. That was a study that came out of Brookings and University of Michigan. Um, but, a, but another study uh, or another publication in, in New England Journal of Medicine, um, you know, looked at there's, there's things that impact in behavioral patterns. There's healthcare access. There's obviously genetic contributors. There's a lot of so, social and, and social um, community circumstances, but it's kind of, bucketed into two big factors when we look at the weak health status of the U.S. according to this particular study. The first is that um, the, the people with the lower income are really not well represented among politics, which really shapes our health policy. And the second is also related to government in that um, the healthcare system or the, the role of government in helping shape healthcare is really limited in the U.S. compared to other countries, other developed nations. Um, so that's kind of my segue to kind of lead Kate into this very detailed discussion on, on some of those factors that contribute to that. And just, can I say one more thing, Kate? I'm so sorry before we turn over to you. So I, I realize some of our listeners, we recently did a poll asking if folks understood sort of the, um, how our insurance is provided in this country, healthcare coverage is provided. A lot of people did not, didn't know what Medicare is or Medicaid. And we also have a lot of listeners from um, out, outside of the US. So just super, super briefly, just wanted to note that the largest payer in the US healthcare system is the federal government uh, through its Medicare and Medicaid programs programs. So Medicare is a social insurance program that provides health insurance to people 65 and older and certain people with disabilities. And Medicaid is a joint federal state uh, program that provides insurance uh, to low income individuals and families. And then, of course, we have private health insurance. That's another major payer. Um, most Americans receive health insurance through their employer, um, but there is also an individual market for health insurance where people can purchase insurance directly from uh, an insurance company. Um, so, OK, I'm just going to put a pin in it there because we need to hear from you, Kate. Um, I think, you know, we want to understand some of the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S. healthcare system. I think we've sort of painted kind of a grim picture here. Um, so can we maybe start with your perspective on the current state of the U.S. healthcare system? And is it completely broken as so many people think it is? Well, you've raised such important issues in your introduction, and there's so many things that I want to follow up on, including disparities in access to care and outcomes, 
how much we spend in the US healthcare system and why, what the outcomes we get from that system look like. So there, there is a lot to discuss in the amount of time that we have. But let me start with the question you raised about whether the US healthcare system is fundamentally broken. And I don't think anyone would argue that we are serving our population consistently well, especially given the amount of money that we're spending. So I think there is uh, ample evidence that we need to improve access to high value care and that we could get more uh, better outcomes for the dollars that we're spending in the system. So on the one hand, much to improve. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that we should start over from scratch. There are lots of really important uh, things that the US healthcare system does deliver. And in fact, the US system is a major driver of innovation in healthcare. And part of the reason that there's that expanding gap in life expectancy is that there are more and more treatments available that unfortunately are not uniformly available, that are available to some part of the population, not others. And the income distribution in the US has widened dramatically over the period that you're talking about. So it's led to much greater disparities but the, the positive aspect of that, which there is one, even though there are huge negative aspects, is that there are more life-saving treatments available than ever. And so if we can find a way to ensure access to those, we're driving improvements that could be available, not just in the US, but around the world through innovations in medicine and care and targeting of treatments. So I wanna make sure that whatever uh, reforms we think about in the U.S. healthcare system take into account those effects on innovation because we want to make sure not only that everybody has equitable access to care, but that that care keeps getting better and better. So that there's uh, a lot to consider in thinking about wholesale reform. Okay, well, that was a thank you for sort of digging us out of the purely grim picture that we painted there. Um, so, okay, just b before we move on, because you're talking about reform and, and saying that we don't really need to start from scratch. Um, and I, certainly we, we want to dig into that more and, and what that might look like. But what would you say if you had to pick, what are the top three biggest issues that the U.S. healthcare system is currently facing? Well, I think we are spending much more on healthcare than we should be for the value of care that's getting delivered. So first, I would want to make sure that uh, dollars were being spent on the highest value care. That goes along with a, a equally important goal of then making sure that that high value care is equitably available to people across the country. And then Third, we have to make sure that uh, care is affordable uh, both to the system that's financing it and to the individuals who are trying to get access to life-saving care. And a lot of the reforms on the table are really good at one and maybe not so good at the others and really do need to achieve all of those to have consistently high quality care available to the whole population. That's a that's a great point, Kate. And I think an argument that we hear a lot is, you know, people shouldn't be going into debt to get medical treatment, right? And and you know, I'm not the 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 healthcare policy expert, so I'm gonna say, yes, I, I agree with that. We should not, we know and 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 to that end, you know, I think that there's a sentiment that that people's ability to access healthcare and to pay for healthcare shouldn't be tied to their employment, right? Especially in the current economic climate where, or even the economic climate over the last several decades where it's, you know, it, there's volatile periods in certain business sectors and so on. So, um, you know, so that, so that's, that's kind of a, a sentiment, um, you know, that we hear pretty often. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, first that kind of sentiment on the whole and and what might be movements to assuage some of those issues or disparities. And and then maybe, you know, you talked about how we're spending far too much for the quality of care we're getting. And and maybe that can segue into, you know, the conception or the or the perception that U.S. healthcare is less focused on preventive care um, and more focused on treatments once issues arise and how that might um, increase or impact healthcare costs. 
Again, lots to unpack there. So I'll start with um, two topics that you raised, although there are a couple of other threads we should follow. One is the financial consequences of either being uninsured or having big co-payments or um, deductibles and what that means for people's financial well-being. And the second is having insurance tied to employment for such a huge swath of the population. So the, the first point is so important, and I'm really glad you brought it up, and that is that insurance is not just supposed to be about access to health care. It's also supposed to be about financial protection in case you get sick or a family member gets sick and making sure that you have access to care that doesn't bankrupt the family. That is a really underappreciated aspect of what insurance is supposed Supposed to accomplish. And it's uh, subtly baked in to a lot of the debate that we hear where people will say things like the people who need insurance the most are sick people. Well, no, the people who need health care the most are sick people. Healthy people need insurance too, because you need to get insurance and in a risk pool before it's determined that you're sick so that you can then have affordable access to care because resources are pooled across sick people and healthy people. And the analogy that I sometimes raise with people is, you know, homeowner's insurance. I have homeowner's insurance in case my house burns down. If my house burns down, it's too late to buy insurance. The cost of insurance at that point would be the cost of a house. Similarly, I think healthy people, it's hard for them to recognize because of the opaqueness of our system, the value that insurance is providing even when they are not necessarily needing care. So you sometimes hear people say, well, I, you know, I wasted all that money paying for health insurance premiums and I didn't even get any care. Well, if you had trouble accessing care, that is a, a major shortcoming of our health insurance system. It's something we should talk about. But if you didn't use care because you were healthy, Congratulations, you were healthy. And I don't think, wow, you know, I paid my homeowner's insurance and my house didn't even burn down. I think, yay, my house didn't burn down. And so making sure that people um, can enjoy the financial protection that insurance provides as well as the access to healthcare so that they don't, you know, risk getting evicted from their apartment because they had to pay a medical bill and couldn't pay their rent. That's a crucial function of insurance. Now, a lot of the insurance we see out in different segments in the US is not great insurance from that perspective. Insurance is supposed to protect you against catastrophic risks. So if you see you know, insurance plans that pay for the first five doctor's office visits with no deductible, but then leave you exposed to your full bills over $100,000 or even over a million dollars, that is not providing the kind of insurance protection on a financial dimension that we, we think good insurance ought to. Going to the second point about why insurance is tied to employment, the challenge of that became incredibly salient during COVID when there was this major public health catastrophe and people desperately needed access to care at the exact moment that so many people were, were losing their jobs and thus their access to the insurance that they had through their jobs. It's a major problem when your employment is the source of your health care during economic downturns and even not when you're thinking about changing jobs. If you are reluctant to change jobs because you might lose your insurance, then we're interfering with labor markets as well as health care markets. It's a historical relic in the U.S. that so much private insurance is tied to employment. It is right now the major way that we do risk pooling outside of public insurance programs. So that idea that healthy people and sick people are all in the same insurance pool and the premiums for the healthy people subsidize the care for the sick people, that is primarily happening through employer provided insurance these days, although the ACA or Obamacare health insurance marketplaces or exchanges were meant to provide an alternative way for people to get that risk pooling outside their jobs. So that, that's a major challenge of the system we have, but also a reason to be cautious about any transition path, because if you disrupt that risk pooling, people may lose out on the important financial protection. So maybe I'll stop there, even though there there's some other things that you raised. Uh, no, I'm I think, honestly, I think because Jeff no, Jess has a follow-up question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, literally, we could we could have a six-hour long podcast and barely scratch the surface. But you're saying so many things on it. When you talk about the ACA, and, and we do have a, a question later on about the ACA that we'd love to ask you, but 
Um, you know, day one as a doctoral student, I was told, read every word of the ACA. And, and I remember, you know, obviously so much of it ended up getting dismantled. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it was frustrating to me because I was thinking, wow, the ACA really needs a better like PR person, because I don't think people understand why there were certain things in place, like the individual mandate requiring that everyone have health insurance for the very reasons that you're raising, the risk pooling and, and in making sure that, yeah, young, healthy people know you're not sick now and you have this, you know, invincibility <laughs> complex. We need you to be, a, I, exactly, we need you uh, to, to be, you know, to, to be a part of, um, this risk pool. So anyway, I could talk about that for forever, but I know when we get into the conversation of reform, we might talk about like Medicare for all and other things like that. So I think a good question for you, Kate, I think people often confuse universal coverage with single payer. For some reason, those two ideas get conflated. Can you help distinguish the two and just talk us through what they mean? Yes, well, I think it's a really important distinction as well because universal coverage suggests that everyone is covered. Now it doesn't say by what plan, paid for in what way and, and provided through what mechanism. So you could imagine a universal system where there's not only a universal payer, the federal government pays for everybody's insurance, but there's a single product that everybody has, call it Medicare, for example, and the providers are also all paid and controlled by the government. That would be one extreme where everything is a single universal system, one size fits all and all publicly provided. Now, a different version of universal coverage would be everybody getting a voucher to go purchase private insurance. And the voucher covers the cost of private insurance and you can go get insurance from any private provider that you like. And the private providers can contract with whatever, um, per, the private insurers can contract with whatever doctors, hospitals, providers uh, that they would like. And the system is largely privately delivered, but it's financed with public dollars. That's a completely different system. Both sometimes have the word universal in them. There are uh, reasons to be cautious of either extreme. There are some, some shortcomings as well as some strengths. We actually have many examples of that in the Medicare program itself where Medicare used to be a, a traditional fee-for-service insurance policy where pretty much all providers participated in Medicare. The government paid specific rates. And when you got to age 65, most people were eligible for Medicare. They would go see whatever uh, provider they wanted. Medicare Part A covered hospitals, Part B covered doctors. And there were really big co-payments um, associated with care in hospitals or certain kinds of care were excluded. So lots of people got wraparound insurance plans or Medigap, and that was the, the traditional mechanism. Medicare Advantage looks more like a, a voucher that you can use with a wide array of private insurers who then contract with providers, doctors, hospitals, and constrained networks, and beneficiaries can choose to be in Medicare Advantage. And that used to be pretty small, but now, more than half of beneficiaries are in Medicare Advantage plans, and that looks like a pretty different version of universal coverage. So we have examples just in Medicare alone of different systems that could be considered in the U.S. So, okay, so what I'm hearing you, you, you saying, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so let's just talk through this. So you're saying, you know, we don't necessarily have to throw out the private insurance options that we currently have. But maybe there's a way to sort of set a social floor or basic policy that would then be available to everyone. Is that what you're envisioning might address some of the problems that we're facing in, in the U.S.? And what would that look like? And is it plausible? Yeah, hey, I, that, that's a, a very nice way of putting it. And I think the question that often gets posed in the public debate is whether healthcare is a right or not. And that's clearly a, a very morally laden, important discussion. But I think the question is ill-posed because to say, is healthcare a right or not, 
supposes that healthcare is one thing. Healthcare is a continuum of things. It's not like you either have it or you don't. There is a really wide range of services from things that are incredibly valuable and cost effective to things that are incredibly expensive and maybe barely improve health at all. In fact, there's some care that's contraindicated that people are getting care that actually harms their health. Well, of course, everyone probably agrees we should not be paying for care that harms people's health. That's a very, very small minority of care. The much bigger question is that continuum of how much should our public systems guarantee? There may be incredibly expensive treatments that extend your life with 10% probability for a month. Should public insurance pay a million dollars for a 10% chance of extending your health, your uh, lifespan by a month? Well, if, if you're that person, you very much value that month. If you're that person's family, you very much value that month. But if we don't wrestle seriously with whether we can afford all care for all people, public insurance would grow so big that we would have no money left for food or housing or education or transportation or any number of public and private priorities. So the, the miracle of modern medicine is that there's a virtually unlimited amount of care that we could deliver to people. Should public programs cover all of that um, versus saying all care that meets a certain value threshold, we want to be available to everyone but care above that threshold with diminishing health benefits. Maybe people should buy that with their own dollars if they would like to and can afford to. And that raises, again, a really important moral question, which is the one I think we have to be wrestling with as a society. Is it okay for higher income people to have access to more and more expensive care that isn't available to everyone? Well, uh, the reality is that that is how it is now, but Lower income people are going without incredibly important, very high value care. So until we wrestle with that question, we're in what I would argue is a much worse state of affairs with incredibly uh, disparate access to care and really effective care not being available to huge swaths of the population. So, you know, very important point and distinction there. And I think it, it kind of opens the door to a simplified discussion of how are other developed nations able to implement these types of healthcare infrastructures where it does deliver a base level of healthcare that is available to everyone, um, you know, for for the most part, kind of paid out of tax dollars and, and, you know, what, what would be the path or what would be the way to move to that, you know, sort of infrastructure in the U S and, and what's really the biggest bottleneck that we're seeing with regard to that. You know, we hear a lot of, well, I don't want my tax dollars going to pay for healthcare of other people as kind of an argument against having these types of, you know, social healthcare programs. But if you actually look at, tax dollars that are being invested in other countries is actually, you know, not not as substantial as as what people's perception may be. And, and obviously, you're the expert with the economics of that. So maybe we can parse some of that out for for our listeners. Great. Well, I'm really glad you brought us back to the international comparisons as well as uh, public perception in the U.S. So let me try to, to tackle those two separately um, on the international comparisons. It is a much more complicated picture than one might initially suppose to do an apples to apples comparison. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the other developed countries, the OECD, you know, we spend twice as much per capita than they do. And it does not look like we have outcomes that are twice as good. In fact, often they're not as good. Uh, if you look at what we spend through public programs, it's about the same per capita as our OECD trading partners. It's just that we then double that amount with private spending on healthcare. So, so surely our healthcare system is not efficient. And I think that that's true, but I think the best evidence of the lack of efficiency actually comes from within the US. So we can turn to that next. But with the international comparisons, the US population looks very different and much more heterogeneous than a lot of the countries that 
we often do the benchmark comparisons to. So when you say, you know, why can't the U.S. be more like Sweden? Well, Minnesota is kind of like Sweden, but we also have Texas and Florida and Illinois and Massachusetts and California and Mississippi. And our population health needs look very different. Our geographic spread, differences in income, differences in social determinants of health, those make a huge difference in our healthcare outcomes. And so it's not all that surprising to me that it takes more spending through the healthcare system to accomplish the same health outcomes in the US compared to other countries when we're entering the healthcare system with so many more health challenges that come from, you know, access to food, access to exercise in healthy spaces, to safe environments, to environmental toxins, to all of the challenges associated with poverty. Uh, we are entering the system with higher rates of high blood pressure and obesity and diabetes. Yeah, we smoke less in the US, so you know, good for us on that. <laughs> but, but there are a lot more um, health challenges that our population is wrestling with. Also, we are a, a large country that has a disproportionate effect on healthcare innovation and delivery. So if we compare prices in the US to elsewhere, you could say, well, wait a minute, why can't we just pay the same prices that Monaco pays? Well, if we were to lower US prices substantially, it would have a much bigger effect on innovation than if a small open economy had the same policy. That doesn't tell us what the right system is, but it just says it's very challenging to generalize from a small homogeneous country to a large heterogeneous country. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of lessons to learn. When I look around the world, there are things that I think we can learn from and adopt in the US, but there's no system that I point to that I can say, if we could just be like the Netherlands, we just take the Netherlands system and dump it here, we would get the same results that they get. Well, there's some really important risk adjustment innovations going on in the Netherlands or public-private hybrids in Germany or consideration of comparative effectiveness in the UK. All of those things I'd wanna draw on, but I can't point to a system and say, we should just have that. That's uh, part of what you were getting at, but then what is the US perception or um, preference preferences of the US population mean for health system reform? Uh, my colleague Amitav Chandra and I did a, a poll in combination with University of Chicago, AP, and ORC, and we uh, found that both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, care about the health of their neighbors and their community as well as themselves. And both would be willing to have some of their tax dollars devoted to access to health care for others. Not exactly the same proportions, but the bigger differences were in people's perceptions about the most effective way of achieving those goals. Who's the most effective um, leader in this? Government, private sector in innovation, individuals. People had different degrees of faith in the government's ability to achieve some of these ends. And I think there, there's real debate to be had about that and thinking about some sort of hybrid system where there is public financing to ensure access. But uh, private sector innovation in delivery and system organization. I think there, there's a, a lot to be said for that. One point just to end on on this thread is we cannot expect private markets to provide social insurance. We talked about the importance of risk pooling and private insurance can do a pretty good job of risk pooling uh, people who will you know, start off as a population with a certain percent who are going to get sick and a certain percent who aren't and pooling that risk. What private insurance cannot do is redistribute from high income to low income, from healthy to sick. If you were choosing a private insurance plan and said, if you are high income, we're going to charge you twice as much, you would probably then choose a different insurance plan. It's up to government to do that social insurance redistribution. So I think there's a, a crucial role for government in preserving access and expanding access to care. All right. There's literally so much I want to ask you. Anytime we talk, even mention a whisper of, you know, building out uh, 
government provided uh, coverage or, you know, Medicare for all or some sort of universal option, people here in the U.S. will always say, well, look to Canada. You know, you can't if you want to be seen, you show up to the to the ER, they won't see you, you know, and, and you'll you'll wait eight months for an X-ray. And, you know, is that how would you respond to someone who says that? Well, I, I do think that when we say universal coverage or universal insurance or, or even single payer, when you look at other countries, it looks a lot more like that multi-tiered system that I was positing in the US than you might think. In countries that have universal coverage, high income people almost always have a mechanism to get more care or to get faster care. And in countries where they don't, the very high income find a way out of the system or around the system. So we would have to make a decision as the US, are we willing to prohibit people from doing that? And that's what it would take to have a single um, standard of care for everyone that no one's care exceeded. I, based on my understanding of what people would uh, vote for, think that that's not likely to occur. I also think there is a value in having higher income people pouring money into innovative care that is not yet established, the value of which is not yet established, because that's how innovation then propagates to the rest of the population. And things that are very expensive to begin with get less, less expensive as they are um, delivered at scale, as competitors come in. So I think we want to continue to drive innovation. But I think it takes some government action, again, to ensure that everybody has access to that minimum amount of care. And what is minimum, that is for, for us to decide as a body politic. And minimum sounds like it would be bare bones, but it, it needn't be. It could be anywhere along that continuum that we decide. We just have to decide explicitly. And then we have to make sure the money's available for it. And the topic I want to be sure we get to uh, during our time is whether expanding health insurance coverage pays for itself. And I think there is a um, mistaken perception that if we expand health insurance coverage like Medicaid, people will go to the doctor's office instead of the emergency room, they'll be able to work more, they'll pay more in taxes, their health will be so much better that it'll in essence pay for itself. Um, that would be lovely if it were true, but my reading of the evidence is that that is not true. When people get access to health insurance, having been uninsured before, they use a lot more health care. And it's because they had too little access to health care when they were uninsured. They use more health care and that makes them healthier, more financially secure, happier, all sorts of good things. But it comes at the cost of the extra health care that they used. And often for public insurance programs, the people who benefit by being enrolled are different from the people who pay for it through higher taxes. So there's a real debate to be had about how much people want to pay in taxes to ensure a minimum amount of access to everyone and what the best use of those resources are. At some point you think, okay, an extra dollar might be better spent on food or housing versus healthcare. And that, that's a real debate to be had. But if we don't go in with eyes wide open, that expanding coverage costs money, we're never gonna have the financial resources available to make the system financially sustainable. And people tend to think, well, wait a minute, we expanded it and it didn't save us any money. To me, that's not the goal of most of these programs. An analogy, again, I think is helpful. Think about food stamps. We don't think food stamps, if we give people access to food, they will become much more productive workers and they will you know, not, uh, need other kinds of services and it'll in fact pay for itself. We think food stamps, they help feed people who are hungry. <laughs> and that's the goal. It's a, it's a positive outcome if you get food to people who would otherwise be hungry and therefore they are less hungry. So I, I think of healthcare in the same way. We have to think of about whether the benefits in improved health and well-being mm -hmm. warrant the cost in terms of in, increased healthcare, not whether the benefits, but the costs are somehow negative or zero. There can right. be positive costs and it can still be a great program if it provides sufficient benefits. All right. I have to just bring up one thing that I feel like if we, if we don't talk about it, um, my husband will be very upset with me. So, um, my, have that. <laughs> so my husband's an ER doctor. 
And we're talking all the time about this over-reliance on emergency rooms for primary care. Um, lots of reasons why that might be the case. Some of the things that we've, we've touched upon already. Um, you know, I don't know that everyone realizes we do have you know, a safety net in this country. There's po a policy called EMTALA. If you show up to the emergency room and you require emergency care, you're going to get it whether or not you have health insurance or coverage or whether or not you can pay for it. And emergency care is ex extremely expensive. Um, and, you know, you're going in, you're, you're dealing with providers who don't know your full medical history. So they're going to order a lot of tests to do workups and diagnostics to understand your health state. And it's just, it, it's not sustainable. And our ER docs, they're already burnt out from COVID. And now they're, they're basically, they're providing primary care when, you know, when, when really they're, they're emergency physicians. So for me, this is something that is, I just like a very hot button issue. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on that, if you feel like that's a big issue facing our healthcare system and, and if there's any way to address that. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And you mentioned at the top kindly our Oregon health insurance experiment, which was an opportunity to uh, figure out what Medicaid, the insurance program for low income Americans or some low income Americans actually accomplishes. What does it do to healthcare utilization, health outcomes, financial security? You would think we would know the answers to these questions, but it's very hard to tease out in the complex system that we have. For example, if you look at the mortality rate of people who are on Medicaid versus the uninsured, they often have higher mortality than the uninsured. And you would say, well, wait, does that mean that Medicaid is killing people? Well, no, you get on Medicaid by being low income or disabled. These things in and of themselves are really hard on your health. And so you would be um, attributing those differences to the program when really it's not about the program at all. In Oregon, they had a waiting list for their Medicaid program before the ACA or Obamacare. They decided the only fair thing to do would be to draw names by lottery from the waiting list. They did this as the most equitable way to, to assign a limited number of slots. But for us as, as fellow health policy and health economics nerds, it was the perfect opportunity to study the effects of Medicaid using a randomized controlled trial because the people whose names were drawn from the waiting list were the treatment group and the people whose names were not drawn were the control group and they were exactly the same except for the luck of the draw. So one of the surprising outcomes from this study, and we studied a lot of different outcomes, one of the most surprising ones was that when people got insurance through Medicaid, they used the emergency room more, not less. And I think there had been a strong presumption by lots of different people, policymakers, healthcare providers, economists, uh, politicians, that if you gave people access to insurance, they would go to the primary care doctor's office and not have to go to the emergency room to get their primary care. Not only did people keep going to the emergency room, they went 40% more when they were insured than when they were uninsured. And this was you know, perplexing to a lot of people. But of course, you point to Mtala saying that people have a, a right to health insurance in the emergency room, whether they can afford it or not. But they may be presented with a giant bill. And there's a huge amount of variation in which hospitals bill people versus writing it off as bad debt versus having a payment plan versus sending the bill to collections. One of the things we found in financial security was that when you expanded Medicaid, people were 25% less likely to have a bill sent to collection. That's a terrible outcome for the person. Your credit report is not just about getting a mortgage, it's about renting an apartment or getting a job. So this was a, a major improvement for individuals, but also for healthcare providers. When bills are sent to collection, they are almost never collected upon. And so not having bills sent to collection means you know, reducing the providers who delivered care and were never paid for it, as well as improving the well-being of the individuals who would otherwise have this black mark following them around in their credit files for the rest of their lives. So uh, people go to the emergency room more when they have insurance because they're not worried about that giant bill. And people pushed back a lot on this result and said, well, is it because people couldn't find a primary care doctor. And so that's why they went to the emergency room. Well, people went to the emergency room 40% more, but they also went to the primary care doctor's office or, or any doctor's office 50% more. People were not only more likely to go to the emergency room, 
and more likely to go to the doctor, they're more likely to both go to the emergency room and the doctor. So it's not just that some people found care through a doctor's office and some people found care through the emergency room. People used more care in the emergency room setting, in the doctor's office, they got more prescription medicines, they went to the hospital more, they got more preventive tests, they used more of everything. Another question was, well, did people just go to the emergency room during off hours because they're working in jobs where they can't get time off to go to the doctor? Well, we found that the increase in emergency department use was just as much during nine to five weekdays as it was evenings and weekends. Another question was, maybe it just takes some time to find a primary care doctor. We found about a 40% increase in emergency room use in the first six months, second six months, third six months, and the fourth and the fifth, and then we ran out of data, but we did not find that this dissipated over time. So, so all of this paints a much more nuanced picture of healthcare use. And when we talked to primary care doctors and said, are you surprised by this finding? They said, no, when I have a patient who's suffering from some symptom that I can't address at that moment, and I say, go to the emergency room, the insured patients go and the uninsured patients don't. And so this, this did not actually surprise healthcare providers nearly as much as it surprised the rest of us health economists. Although as health economists, we weren't all that surprised, I have to say, because you took something that was expensive and you made it free, and then people use more. So the moral of the story is that demand slopes down even for healthcare. So Andrea, do you wanna, can you maybe, I know we're, we're coming up on time here, but maybe wrap um, with what we see all the time, people saying how you know their issues with the healthcare system drive them maybe to- Yes. Yes, oh, yeah. absolutely. So, so I think, you know, and, and, and some of this was exacerbated during the COVID pandemic, particularly with regard to access to certain types of medical care, like, like mental health care is very hard to find. I mean, for obvious reasons, there's a lot of, you know, people seeking care. Um, but, but, you know, there's this, there's this um, frustration with the infrastructure of the U.S. healthcare system, um, whether it is, um, due to a lack of, you know, you have symptoms and we don't have a medical explanation for them. We've run the gamut of tests and we we just, we don't know everything, right? There are things that we we haven't been able to characterize or they're frustrated by the time it takes to get in to see a certain provider or they, because of the capitalistic or for-profit nature of our healthcare system, they feel like they're rushed and they're not being heard by their healthcare provider. And, and as such, they turn to unproven alternative practitioners who are not covered by insurance because the treatment or the recommendations they're providing are not supported by evidence. Um, but they will charge you a lot of money and listen to you and be very empathetic. And that leads people to feel like their medical needs are being addressed. And but ultimately also opens the door for people to start um, utilizing treatments, diagnostics, even aligning themselves with diagnoses that don't actually exist, um, that are unregulated and potentially harmful. What's your perception or perspective on this and what can we do to kind of address this or, you know, at least um, give people an understanding that, yes, we get that this is a challenging system to navigate, um, but like Jess always likes to say, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, this is a, a good discussion for us to end on, perhaps. First, I would not have all, at all wanted to suggest by our prior discussion that I think the U.S. system is working well. You know, when I point to challenges in other systems and just adopting the whole cloth here, that doesn't mean that what we have is serving our population well. It is surely not on lots of dimensions. The complexity of the system is incredibly challenging for patients working their way through. It's incredibly frustrating for providers who want to spend time talking with patients, better understanding their needs and are rushed through their day and fighting with electronic systems. And, and despite that, our systems are not interoperable. You go to one provider, all the information is lost when you go to another provider. There are all sorts of um, inefficiencies 
both in terms of how we're spending our time and money and in terms of uh, health outcomes that aren't what they should be because of our incredibly patchwork system and because of our lack of coordination across insurers and across providers. So there is much improvement that could be uh, gleaned if we could find a way to bridge a lot of these divides. But I worry a lot about a generalized distrust in science and medicine and expertise and why I am such a fan of your podcast, because there is um, some, something that's happened over the last six, eight years is that the belief that experts have valuable expertise to contribute and a, a deference to expertise on matters in that expert's area, uh, that's eroded a lot. And we see that in the tragedy of uptake of the COVID vaccine and COVID precautions, where things that I would not have dreamed would be political are clearly incredibly politicized. And that is to all of our detriment in terms of health outcomes and in terms of um, ability to take new advances, new information, and make sure that everyone in the population has access to them. I, of course, am not only a health economist, but an academic. I'm in the business of trying to generate evidence to help people and policymakers make the best informed decisions that they can. Uh, it's enough to make you what, wonder what you're doing with your life if people really don't um, see the value in that expertise. But I believe very firmly that advances in science and better evidence can really make us all better off. And we need to do a better job of communicating that in a world where communication channels have completely changed and where everything is hyper-polarized. And as both a researcher and an academic, I think we used to have this um, delusion perhaps that evidence speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And that if you can get the right answer and send it out into the world, it will fly to all of the places it needs to be. And that is just not the case. And so it, it behooves us as people who care about evidence and, and decision-making grounded in that evidence for individuals and for systems to spend some time and energy spreading that information in a way that is accessible to the people who need it in the time frame in which they need it. And that is something that academics are not traditionally very good at, um, trying to de-jargon things and boil them down to their essence, and also to produce new answers along a timeline that's actually relevant for policymakers and saying, you know, guess what? I figured out what was going on in the 1917 flu. Which, again, there's still really good information there. Those are good studies. We also need to figure out what just happened with COVID and yeah. faster so right. that policymakers can use that when you know the inevitable, unfortunate the next one. Happens. Right. Yeah. And and Kate, that thank you so much for that. And we could not agree more. And that's why we're so grateful to have this conversation. There needs to be more interdisciplinary. We, we you know, um communicators need to be working with academics and policymakers. We need to do, you know, we cannot operate in silos. Um, and so really we just we I, I'm sort of, I feel like I, I'm in a fever dream. I said the same when we had Dr. Peter Hotez on. I can't believe like, oh my God, I'm speaking to the Dr. Catherine Baker. Thank you so much for your time, your insights, your expertise. You are incredible. This was such a great conversation. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And I so value the work that you're doing. So <laughs> keep it up and I'll look forward to hearing future episodes. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Any last words that you want to leave our listeners with before we officially wrap up? That was my best wrap up. All right, all right, all right. We'll cut it. We'll cut it. We'll cut it. All right. Well, thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Catherine Baker, for joining us. Your expertise is unmatched in this space. We hope that our listeners have you know, at least gleaned a little bit um, of the complexities of our healthcare system and why it isn't so simple to simply compare our country to other countries. Um, and, and the fact that there's a lot of 
social and and collective change that needs to happen in order for our healthcare infrastructure to change. So we do hope you learned a thing or two. And if you want to support our efforts, help us grow the impact and reach of unbiased science, please feel free to visit our website where you can send us a donation. Um, and we have our fun line of sn snarky merch this season. So if you want a shirt that says your anecdote is not evidence or um, your body is a sack of chemicals, definitely pick up one of those. You can find all of our information on our website at www.unbiasedscipod.com. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are recording video for our pods this season. Um, our handle is at unbiasedscipod, as is the handle for all of our other social channels, um, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, LinkedIn, and whoever else, you know, is out there. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.